you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm 97. Psalm 97. I'd like you to look at verses 2 and onward. I'll read those here in just a moment. Psalm 97. Starting at verse 2. Paints quite a picture. I just want you to kind of imagine what the reality of this is and especially will be in the final days. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and burns up his enemies round about. His lightnings light the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax at the presence of the Lord. At the presence of the Lord of the whole earth, the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the peoples see his glory. Now, that's a pretty imposing spectacle. It, um, I, I, I think, you know, I mean, you, you read the experiences of, of Isaiah and Daniel when they and Job would be another one when they had an encounter with the Lord and, and they, they fell to the ground or they, there was no strength in them. Or Job says, I abhorred myself. And Isaiah says, woe is me. Um, coming face to face with the might and the power and the glory and the righteousness of the Lord. It's, it's, a, it's a momentous thing. But I want you now to go back up to the beginning of the chapter. What does verse 1 say? The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the multitude of isles be glad. <laughs> In the middle of even the challenging the impressive, the intimidating experiences of God, there should be joy. There should be joy. So this morning, I, as uh, Reed mentioned, I want to talk about the happiest people in the world. But before we do that, I would just uh, invite you to kneel with me in prayer. <coughs> Father, on this Sabbath morning, on this memorial of your creation, we pray that you would be with us. Lord, we, we would long to have you with us in such a manifest manner that we might experience, uh, we might see the, the glory of the Lord, the tempestuous fire round about him, that we might see the, the, uh, the shining of his features. And Father, we would desire that in every experience that we have, in, that in, in all of our, of all our relationship with you, that you would work in us, that we might always be glad in your presence that though there is yet sin in our lives, though there are those things for which certainly we must repent and we desire cleansing, yet, Father, we pray that you would work in us, that we might be happy in your presence. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs> So the, uh, the title of the presentation is The Happiest People in the World, and 
you will not understand the subtitle, but the subtitle is Green Peas and Apple Pie. Um, that will become clear later on. So, <clears throat> in all things, God has a plan for his people. And I find it easier, sometimes I don't have the privilege, but when I have the opportunity, I prefer to understand what God's plan is so that I can consciously work in harmony with it. Now, sometimes he sees no value in revealing his plan to me. <laughs> and so I, I work you know, through a glass darkly, shall we say. But when I can understand his plan, then I like to. And so I have um, three references here I'd like you to uh, consider as a part of his plans. These things, Jesus said, I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Part of God's plan is that we be joyous. And while joy is not the only element of the Christian life, I have my suspicions about that which claims to be Christianity that isn't joyous. Paul says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. And again, in Thessalonians, Paul says, Rejoice always. It's one of those interesting features of human experience that it takes a while in a person's life to recognize the value of joy and peace. Um, quite a few of the congregation here today are fairly young. And the truth is, when you're young, excitement and desire often overrule any particular longing for joy and peace. Does that make sense? You want to have fun. That's, that's a, a mindset that will probably change for you, those of you who are young. Okay? I suppose there are some people that just, their minds are so fixed they never change anything, but you know, whatever. Uh, but as a, as a person grows older, which seems to be an unavoidable reality of life on here, here on earth, there is a tendency to see greater value in the simple pleasures of joy peacefulness. Uh, it's one reason that the Psalms, you know, it's, it's always been intriguing to me, old people love the Psalms. Young people, not so much. <laughs> you, know, you may like a few here and there, but, but uh, trust me, if you're, if you're still, still fairly young, they will come to mean more to you as you age a little bit. You know, because your experience, you'll see, you'll find more reflected in the Psalms. You can look at, oh yeah, man, I remember the time that happened to me. And, and you will resonate more with the Psalms as you, as you grow older. That's just a part of life. It's not a bad part, it's just a part. Okay? But nonetheless, joy, joy is to be a part of the Christian life. We can, sometimes, you know, there's a, I wouldn't want to try and define the difference, but, you know, maybe we can kind of mentally uh, deal with the idea that there might be a difference between joy and simply fun. You know, they're, they're, they, maybe they overlap, but, uh, you know, it's just kind of an interesting concept. So, you know, roll that around, do what you want with that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you went looking to see which of these verses has had the most written about it, which one do you think it would be? Any guesses? Uh, hang on to that. We'll come back to it. Let's see. Okay. Okay, I want to start off with kind of a reality check here. Okay? So let's just read through this. It's an interesting passage from the book Fundamentals of Christian Education. It says, Do not for a moment suppose that religion will make you sad and gloomy and will block up the way to success. Now, there's another element there that 
might resonate with young people. You know, I think there's a, a desire for success, whatever that may be defined as, you know. Religion will not make you sad and gloomy. It will not block up the way to success. The religion of Christ does not obliterate or even weaken a single faculty. Okay, now the idea of a faculty is a, a skill or a talent or an ability that you might have or a, a function of your brain. The, the religion of Christ does not weaken any of those. It in no way incapacitates you for the enjoyment of any real happiness. It is not designed to lessen your interest in life or to make you indifferent to the claims of friends and society. It doesn't do any of that. It does not mantle the life in sackcloth. It is not expressed in deep-drawn sighs and groans. I've seen a few saints who seem to specialize in deep-drawn sighs and groans. It never really appealed to me much. I'll just be honest. Uh, as, a, as a young person, teenager type of thing, that was not a, a real selling point to me on, on Christianity is deep drawn sighs and groans. There's a time and a place, yes, we should, you know, sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land. That's a part of things too, but this is not where Christianity takes us. That's where sin takes us, right? No, no, those who in everything make God first and last and best are the happiest people in the world. You know, I remember years ago, I, I, I think I was just a kid, I heard this story first, and I don't know, I'm just a simple-minded guy. It resonated with me. And uh, you've probably heard the story too, but the, the idea was that somebody asked a, a little child, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, and, well, you can be a fireman or a policeman or a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer or, you know, whatever else, okay. And the little kid thought for a moment, he said, when I grow up, I want to be happy. That made sense to me. <laughs> Maybe it's just because I'm not sophisticated enough to think beyond that too far or something. I don't know. But, but it makes sense to me. And I, I've always wanted to be happy. And I'll be honest, I think that was really a blessing to me because I was never attracted to the idea of a job for the sake of, of salary. Uh, I don't know how many jobs I've taken with absolutely no idea what the salary would be until I got there and you know, actually got a paycheck. And it's, oh, okay, well, that's what we're living on then. <laughs> you know, I, I, I take the job because I believe in the job, you know, and the salary is entirely negotiable. Um, and I've had fun doing it, and I don't regret a minute of it. So, you know, for whatever that's worth. But let's... Uh, Look at this a little bit more here. The, there is a messiness to this question, though, okay? The, this quotation, you know, if you just read the quotation, it seems nice and simple, really straightforward. Okay, so when I'm a Christian, I should be happy. And, you know, we might want to just read that and just not look at it any deeper, not deal with the fact that life doesn't always seem to go that way. You know, have you, ever, you, you run into statements like that, both the Bible and spirit prophecy, you'll find something where it's a, a strong statement and it seems like, oh, that's the way it ought to be, but in the back of your mind you're saying, well, it's not really always that way, but, you know, let's just, let's not mess with it. Let's just leave it alone, right? So you just smile and you nod and you pretend that life is just, you know, always like that. You know, always, I'm just always a happy guy. Life is good. But that only works for a while. And, and maybe, for some people, it just never really works at all. Okay. Um, since I've been talking about medical missionary work this last week, I'd like to just simply say this is especially important in that context because there is a lot of inconvenience involved in that work. Uh, by definition, <laughs> medical missionary work is helping other people, and that usually causes you a certain amount of trouble or expense or time taken or something. Okay, there's going to be some level of inconvenience involved in medical missionary work. It, just, it can't be otherwise. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it can eventually be, get elevated, escalated all the way up to the point of just out-and-out -out persecution. You know, somebody may want to kill you. That's inconvenient. You know, that's, that's probably not on any of our to-do lists for the day, right? 
So things happen. Things come along. Medical mission work can be costly in a lot of ways. Um, remember, Jesus is known as the great medical missionary. And, and as you may recall, he was killed because of it. There's no guarantee at all the same thing won't happen to you. If you follow in Christ's steps, you might die like Jesus did. Okay? Scripture has quite a few hints that you really should be ready uh, for persecution to come your way, right? All who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, right? It says that. So despite the mess that looking at this any further is going to take, I want to try and figure out how this happiness stuff is supposed to fit in to all the details that we're looking at here. So let's start off with the bad news. <laughs> Through yielding to sin, man placed his will under the control of Satan. He became a helpless captive in the tempter's power. Well, that doesn't sound good at all. Helpless. Helpless. Not a thing you can do about it. Notice what's involved here. What was it that was... Uh, what was involved in this transaction? Man yielded to sin, and what happened? What was the component? The, the will, in particular, yes. The will was placed under Satan's control. That we'll be focusing on that. And hence, having his will taken into the control of Satan, he became, yes, a captive, uh, a helpless captive. Well, okay, that's the bad news. Uh, some good news is in order now. God sent his son into our world to break the power of Satan and to emancipate the will of man. He sent him, God sent Christ, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free. Uh, what, what's that a quotation from? Isaiah 58, of course, okay. So here is a, a, a great response to those who might encourage you to be involved in a purely social gospel where all, you're giving out physical food and providing physical health care and physical something else and, and divorcing it from the spiritual work. Uh, don't do that because the greatest of burdens, the, uh, the, the greatest loss of liberty, uh, the greatest oppression is Satan having taken our wills captive, okay? Okay, so what Jesus did is a marvelous improvement over being, having our wills captive to Satan. Um, and this is, he was doing his work of Isaiah 58, Isaiah 61, right? All that whole thing we talked about. Once again, the focus here is on the will of man to emancipate the will of man. Everybody know what emancipate means? Basically, it means to be set free. Okay? So you really can't emancipate something or someone unless it's being held captive. Okay? So in the American Civil War, there's, uh, you know, in our history over there, uh, when Abraham Lincoln finally partway through the war, he, he issued what's known as the Emancipation Proclamation. And that's when he said, you know what, wherever the United States is in charge, or wherever the army takes of the southern world, the southern country there, the, the rebellious country, whatever, the slaves are immediately free. Okay? And so that's the emancipation. So, so God, his plan is to emancipate, to set free the will of man. Okay. Uh, we're going to need to look at that in a little more detail. So let's move on to that. <clears throat> Every child, we've got some quite young children here. This is something that would be good for them to somehow be learning, even at this age. I'm not enough of a child psychologist to tell anybody exactly how that can be done, but you know, still, it's a good thing. 
Some of the rest of us are a little older, and we may not be considered children anymore. But if somewhere along the line we miss this lesson as children, now's a great time to learn it. <laughs> so every child should understand the true force of the will. He should be led to see how great is the responsibility involved in this gift. The will is the governing power in the nature of man, the power of decision or choice. Okay. Everyone may place his will on the side of the will of God, may choose to obey him, and by thus linking himself with divine agencies, he may stand where nothing can force him to do evil. Okay, so just kind of follow this now. What is the will? It's, it's the governing power, the power of decision or choice. I, I don't think I have it in this presentation. I don't remember seeing it when I looked this morning, but you know. Uh, there's another statement where she says, the will is not the taste or the inclination. That's not the will. I may like this or desire that. But that's, not, that's not my will. The will is when I say, this is what I'm going to do. I choose to do this. Okay, so just think of will as the power of choice. Freedom. You know, the one thing a slave does not have is the, the power of choice. Somebody else makes the decisions. Choice is a, an amazing thing. When you look at the great controversy, I think I could argue that the power, the freedom of choice is one of the most highly valued of possessions in the universe. If, if God did not highly value freedom of choice, then he, he really missed the opportunity to solve a lot of problems with Lucifer a long time ago. He could have simply taken Lucifer's choice from him and, and just squashed this whole sin issue in the bud, right? The very fact that God is willing to put up with thousands of years of the inconvenience and sorrow and suffering that sin has brought on to me, is very clear testimony of how highly he values freedom of choice. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, let's see. That may, you know, that's not too complicated. The will, the governing power, very valuable, very important. It's choice, okay? Um, in this one, it says that everyone may place his will on the side of the will of God. But our last statement said that man placed his will under the control of Satan. He became a helpless temp, uh, captive in the tempter's power. Up there at the top up there, that's what I'm reading there. So, so is there a conflict here? Or how, do we, how do we, you know, and one says we're, everyone may place his will on the side of Christ. The other one says we, our, 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 our will is captive. It's under Satan's control. Certainly Satan is not going to put our will on the side of Christ. So, you know, there's, there's a little something going on here, and, and that's part of what we want to try and understand, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, I had that down there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so between those two references, is there something that we need to understand better, right? How does this all really work? Well, let's take another look here at some bad details, okay? You must remember that your will is the spring of all your actions. Well, you don't do what you don't decide to do. Does that make sense? You know? So the will is the spring of all your actions. When you... You know, sometimes we, we like to almost deny that we're responsible. You know, well, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't resist it. It was on sale, so I had to buy it. You know? <laughs> well, um, no, actually, you had to decide to buy it, you know. Okay, so your will is the spring of all your actions. This will 
that formed so important a factor in the character of man was at the fall given into the control of Satan. So that's back on the bad side, right? And he has ever since been working in man to will and to do of his own pleasure, but to the utter ruin and misery of man. Well, that's no way to be happy. So what's going on with the will? Am I free? You know, do I have free will or do I not? That's gone. <clears throat> the sentence, the, 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 uh, this is the same quotation, right? Um, did I hit the wrong button? I hit the wrong button. That's, that was throwing me off. Okay, here we go. Now we go on. Okay. But the infinite sacrifice of God in giving Jesus, his beloved son, to become a sacrifice for sin enables him to say, without violating one principle of his government, yield yourself up to me, give me that will, take it from the control of Satan, and I will take possession of it then I can work in you to will and to do of my good pleasure. Okay, so now, how is this all fitting together, right? I'm going to back up once here. No, I keep hitting the wrong button. I've got to get my fingers in the right spots here. Okay. Here it says that the will was at the fall given in the control of Satan. So how much control do I have over my will or not? That's, that's the, the issue, so to speak, okay? But the, the quotation goes on, it's the same reference, and says that because of this intervention of the sacrifice of Christ, it allows him to say, without violating his government, yield yourself up to me, give me that will. Now, how do I give Christ my will if I don't have my will? Satan has my will. Does that make sense? At the fall, it was given into his control. Take it from the control of Satan. And Jesus says, I will take possession of it, then I can work in you. Okay. So here's, here's the picture I'm getting. I don't have my will, naturally. Satan does. But through the intervention of the plan of salvation, I have been given an option not the option of taking my will back, but the option of saying, no, you can't have it, Satan. It goes over here. Does that make sense? Okay. It's not that it comes back to me the same way it was before the fall. I'm unfit to manage it. <laughs> We cannot control our will, but we can, and I'm just going to pick a word here, we can administer our will. Okay? And by that, all I mean is we have the choice not of the whole gamut of what our will would have been before the fall, but we have the choice of saying which of two supernatural powers is going to control that will. When the devil is in charge of our wills, we can't always choose what we want. Okay, now sometimes, I'll, I'll just be honest, I don't know exactly how it works. You know, I don't know the absolute fine level. You know, at some point, all this theoretical talk, it has to actually interface with, with um, biology, <laughs> you know, <laughs> chemicals, brains, nerve cells, you know. How does that work? Oh, I'd love to know, but I don't know, okay? So, if the devil has control of my will, do I get to choose? Does he give me the, the, the privilege of choosing between two different sins? I don't know. You know, he may say, okay, as long as you're sinning, I don't care which one you choose. You know, <laughs> he may say that. I don't honestly know at what level and through what details and through what actual biochemical chemistry he, he works this okay but I am certain of this much 
when it's in Satan's control, we cannot choose all that we might wish to choose intellectually. This is Paul, you know, the good that I know I do not. Okay? Okay. By God's grace, we've been given the opportunity to take our will from the control of Satan and give it to Christ. That's really the one door of hope that we've got. I don't think we necessarily have to understand this in theoretical terms in order to make it happen, right? Uh, Jesus is uh, very gracious, and without any theoretical understanding of it, the experience can be ours, no doubt. But I think there is some value in thinking it through and thinking it, and looking at it and saying, okay, how does this work? How does, how does God actually work in my life to, to mold my experience and to control my will? I'm going to use a, an illustration here talking about the process of decision. That's what the will does. It's the, it's the power of choice or decision, right? Okay. Okay, so... If the issue comes down to yielding ourselves to Christ or to Satan, right? You take the will from Satan and you give the will to Christ, okay? Uh, then you can see how, you know, Ellen White's comment makes sense. It says everything depends on the right action of the will, okay? How does it work? Okay, I'm going to use a very simple little illustration, try and make some sense of this. The, like all human illustrations, it's probably insufficient or defective. It's, it's not going to be perfect. Um, but I found it very useful, and a lot of my students in the past have found it somewhat helpful. Put it that way. So this is the kingly power of the will. That's supposed to be a crown. Okay, Kings wear crowns, on occasion at least. So this is the kingly power of the will, the ruling power governing power in the nature of man, okay? So the will makes decisions. But how? What's the process? I'm going to you know, use this as, by way of illustration. This may not be perfect, but it, it's pretty close, I think. And by way of analogy, we're going to say that the will, the king, has three counselors. He seeks advice. Here's a decision. I have to decide this or that. And so the king turns to his three counselors, and he says, what is your counsel? What should I do? Notice the, the three counselors. Conscience, common sense, and desire. These are elements of the mental faculties that are clearly identified in Bible and Spirit prophecy. Conscience, common sense, and desire. These are the three that give input on a, on a decision. So each of these counselors offers his counsel to the king based on a, a single question. And so you probably could have thought this up yourself. Conscience, if a, an issue comes up, oh, do I do this or do I do that? The one question conscience asks is, is it right? Is it moral? Is it, you know, is it right? Okay. What would common sense ask? What's that? Will it work? Will it be practical? Okay. Um, I cut it even a little shorter than that. I just say, is it best? You know, I mean, if I, uh, so, you know, common sense might be in matters of investment of, of money, say. If I'm going to invest some money, I can invest it here at 0.1% or I can invest it over here at 4%. Well, which is best? Yeah. Okay. So that's the kind of question that common sense would ask. What would desire ask? Is it fun? What do I get out of it? Okay. Um, is it fun? Could have been. Um, yeah, I, I, I went with something a little bit, a little bit broader, but that's pretty close. Just, do I want it? Okay. Now, if you think about the decisions that you have to make on a day-by-day -day basis, 
I think you'll find that they always hinge on these three questions. And it's kind of nice to understand them a little bit, to just be able to, to mold this around. Now, how many answers can conscience give to that question, is it right? Two. How many answers from common sense? Two. How many answers from desire? Two. What do we call one or the other type of issues? In the computer world, what do we call that? Either or, or binary. Okay, you've heard of binary code. This is yeah, that's how, how life works sometimes. Okay, so anybody, uh, anybody really good with math? I'm sorry, I'm more of a teacher than a preacher here, and I'm lapsing into teacher mode, but how many combinations are there if I have two times two times two, basically? <laughs> It's two to the third power, which is what we call permutations, right? So how many different combinations of advice could I get from my three counselors? Eight. There we go. Thank you. Somebody is good at math. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so here they are. All three could say yes. The first two could say yes, and the last one could say no. The first one could say yes. The middle one says no, and the last one says yes. The first one could say yes, and the last two could say no. The first one could say no, and the last two, yeah, okay, you see the combinations, okay? Now, you face decisions that will meet every one of those patterns at some point or the other. Which decisions are the easy ones? What's that? All three, yes, is pretty, pretty easy. Is there anything else that's just about as easy? All three no's, <laughs> okay, yeah. At the top and the bottom, these are the easy decisions in life, okay? And so I just filled in a couple of nice, simple examples for that, right? Should I eat this beautiful, tasty, organic strawberry I grew in my own garden, okay? <laughs> you know, is it, uh, is it moral? Well, there's nothing, certainly, I mean, it's in my own garden. I didn't steal it, you know, you know? okay? So it's, it's, it's according to conscience. It's... It's uh, organic, there you go, so that's common sense, you know, it's, it's, it's fresh fruit, it has, you know, it's not refined, that's good common sense. It's beautiful and tasty, and so yes, I desire it. So, piece of cake, yes, I'm going to eat the strawberry, move on to the next issue, which hopefully is another strawberry. But you know, okay, down the bottom, should I get myself killed trying to steal this ugly piece of modern art that I don't like and can't sell? <laughs> You know, what does that idea have, have going for it? Nothing, okay? Uh, it's, it's immoral because I'm trying to steal something. Uh, is it best? Probably not. I'm, I might get killed. Do I want it? No, it's, it's, it's ugly. I don't like it. And, you know, how much chance is there of selling stolen art? Anyhow, so there's, there's nothing good to be said for that idea. Easy decision. Hmm. What are the hard decisions? In the middle. In the middle, there are six left, and they can be more challenging. I'll give you two. Shall I give away 10% of my paycheck? We'll talk about tithes. Conscience says yes, but at one level, common sense says, no, man, you need the money. And desire says, well, how am I ever going to buy that motorcycle if I keep giving away my money? Right? You know, I need the money. I want the money. It's best to keep the money. But conscience says, you know, God says it's not your money, man. <laughs> Pay the tithe. For some people, that's a real challenging, challenging decision, right? And I made up another one here. Shall I just keep the wallet full of money I found? Well, common sense might say, well, yeah, it's a lot of money. That will be best for you. Desire says, yeah, I can buy that motorcycle now. <laughs> Conscience says, uh, no, man, it's not your money. You know, there's, a, there's a driver's license in here. The guy's not that hard. Track him down. Give him his wallet back. You know, that's the honest thing to do. Okay? Uh, the others might be, I didn't make any more up, but that's, this is a, an assignment I would always give my students when we went over this in Bible class. You, know, you figure out you know, what, what, what fits on the second line, what fits on the third line. You know, and it's, it gets, it's, it's interesting, but you'll find that there's, there's things that always fit. What makes the, one, the six in the middle 
Well, I'll, I won't make that a statement. I'll make that a question. What is it that makes the six in the middle complicated? I mean, the top and bottom are easy because, but the, comp the middle are complicated because? Depending on your values. Yes, that's true, but that would even affect the top and bottom. What, what else did I hear? Conflict is, is, is the primary thing that I want. Yeah, okay. It's, it's conflict, right? You've got three counselors. And whenever you have conflict, it's two against one. <laughs> okay? Which two and which one? Um, is that right? Always two against one? Yeah, it's always two against one. Okay. Has to be, I guess, if you have three. That makes life harder to make a decision. Because they're all important, right? Um, you know, children that grow up in a home where mom and dad don't agree, wow, that makes a mess out of their poor little brains. Yeah, their mom and dad are both important. But mom wants me to do this and dad wants me to do that. What do I do? What do I do? That's, that's hard on a kid. It's very hard on a kid. That's why parents should be united, ideally. Okay. So, but now this isn't mom and dad. This is my own brain talking to me, my conscience, my common sense, my desire. Hmm. Okay. Well, since we have a conflict, logic says we're going to have to ignore one or more counselor no matter what we do. If that's true, well, then we should... Follow the most important. But what's the most important? How do you know which one's the most important? What process could we use to decide which piece of advice is the most important advice? Think of it like this. Suppose you're in the army. And maybe you have a sergeant, a lieutenant, and a major, and they all tell you, march to the right. But there's a general standing there, and he says, march to the left. What are you going to do? Nobody's been in the army here? <laughs> That's not a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> Sergeant, lieutenant, and major say that way. General says that way. What are you going to do? <laughs> okay, thank you. That's great. <laughs> You're also timid here. <laughs> okay. Why? Why do you listen to the general? Higher position, which means what? Authority, which means what to me? And I know this is going to sound really negative. I always have a hard time. You know, people, people will walk through the line of logic that far. That's exactly right. He can hurt me more than the other guys. <laughs> okay? I am making this decision out of simple self-preservation. <laughs> okay? These guys, yeah, they could make my life miserable. The general? I don't even want to think about it. Okay? So... <laughs> Maybe that's not a perfect illustration, but let's look at it. What happens, since I'm going to have to ignore at least one and possibly two of these counselors, what's the result of ignoring them? So what's the, what, what happens if I ignore my conscience? What's the immediate result? Sin, okay, which produces... Mm, that's not as immediate as I'm looking for. It could be immediate, immediate, but I'm looking for something that's sort of intermediary there. Guilt. Okay, so I violate my conscience. I feel guilty. Okay, if I continue to violate my conscience, I'll say until the day I die, the end result of it is death. What nature of death? Eternal death. Okay, so violating conscience. I feel guilty. In the end, I lose eternal life. What's the, what's the result of violating common sense? I'm sorry? Less profit. 
I'm going to just make that loss. Okay, you're casting it still in a very positive light. You know, I could have made this much, but I'm only making this much. So you're focusing on the less profit down here, and I'm going to focus on the loss. <laughs> okay? What would be an extreme case if I ignored common sense? Suppose, thank you, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Suppose someone says, hey, Dave, do you think you can jump this, um, and we can build a ramp, and you can jump over the freeway on your bicycle? Maybe. I'll try it. That's not really common sense, <laughs> okay? Not for me, anyhow. Some people, you know, they do stupid things on bicycles, but that's, that wouldn't be smart at all for me. And yes, I could end up, I will certainly have loss of some sort or the other, okay? I might also injure myself or I might kill myself. I think that's what we have here. Yeah, loss, injury, death, okay? What happens if I ignore desire? I'm unhappy. Now, I put another word on there, too. I'm unhappy. That's what I would consider the short-term effect of ignoring desire. You know, I really wanted that, and eh, I didn't get it, or I didn't have the opportunity, or I didn't take the opportunity, or whatever it might be. You know, I wanted to eat that strawberry, but yeah, okay, I didn't, didn't get the strawberry. I don't know if you can read it, but the next word there is bitterness. Okay, Hang on to that thought for just a second. So if you look at those three counselors, the result of ignoring them, which one's worst? What's that? Oh, first one you said. First one. Okay, I had to replay it back and understand. Yeah, obviously, conscience. Ignoring conscience is so, so conscience takes the role of like the general, right? So if conscience says this is what you need to do, then logic says I, I should do what conscience says, right? Now maybe it's an amoral issue where it's not it's not really a, you know there's no moral component, and in that case conscience would just eh, you know I I abstain, no vote type of thing, okay. That's a decision like, should I eat a banana or an apple? Well, conscience doesn't care. You know, it's like, I don't know. It doesn't matter. So then I could look at common sense and desire. Which one of those two should take precedence? Common sense. Maybe I'm allergic to bananas. Right? Anaphylactic shock type of thing. Okay. Common sense would say, stick with the apple, Dave. <laughs> oh, but I really like bananas. Stick with the apple. Okay. So, we, you know, conveniently enough, we have them in the order of importance. You know, conscience is the most important. Common sense is next. Desire, yeah, desire gets what's left over. Hmm. In theory, that's the way it is. In practice, not so much. Here's the funny thing. Desire ends up being the controlling power in the long run. Hang on to that thought. So <clears throat> dealing with this issue of desire, let me just ask a question. Is it proper to obey God when you don't want to obey God? Uh, let me set the stage before you answer that. Okay? There are some theologians, and actually some Adventist theologians as well, who have said that you know, all we can actually do in our religious life is the, 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 these three things. You know, these three eh, pretty broad categories, but you know, still, they'll say that the, the only things that we can actually do in terms of, of fostering our religious life, we can pray, we can study, and we can witness. Right? Have you ever heard that list? Pray, study, witness. And then, they say, beyond that, we should live as we feel, like living. Knowing that there are some things right and wrong, but for us to do that which we know to be right, when we don't want to do what we know to be right, is actually just works righteousness. It's, it's legalism. 
I don't want to pay tithe, but I'm going to pay tithe because that's what I have to do to get to heaven. Hmm. Well, am I going to get to heaven by paying tithe? No. No. My works are of no value. So what they would say is the thing to do is to continue, wit, uh, uh, pray, witness, and study, and count on God to change you so that you want to pay tithe. And when you want to pay tithe, then you start paying tithe. Then it's God's righteousness, not your own. Is that, do you follow that, that line of logic? Okay. So now here's my question. Are they right in saying that? Or is it wrong? And so I'll go back to the original question. Is it wrong to try to obey God when I don't feel like obeying him? And so here's, I'll help you out on that because it's kind of a tricky question. I tried to set it up just about as trickily as I could. My apologies, but you know, I did. <laughs> okay. So uh, help, help you out on that. Can you think of a Bible example that would help answer the question? He, he, oh, he maybe didn't want to. He maybe didn't. We don't know for sure. <laughs> yeah, but I've done things by faith that I wanted to do. You know, I mean, you know, they wanted to walk through the Red Sea, didn't they? They had to do that by faith. I'm just arguing. Don't, I, it's, it's a good answer, but I'm just, I'm arguing. I'm, I'm going to just, you know, make it hard for you. Okay. Did you? Yeah, you don't think they wanted to do that? Um. <laughs> oh, but we don't know for sure. <laughs> yes. Moses refused to go to, to the Pharaoh. Yes. Okay. Well, that's a little that's that's a little bit better, Patrick. What occasion? Many. Oh, but there's one in particular. Gethsemane is our answer. Okay. Did somebody else say that? Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Yes, you said Gethsemane. Very good, okay. Gethsemane is the perfect answer because it's absolutely explicit. Not my will, but thine be done. Now, that tells us some really fascinating things. Number one, it tells us it is not a sin to not want what God wants for me. I mean, Jesus said, you know, I don't want to do what you want me to do. I have my own will, and it's not the same as yours. That's not a sin. But he also said, not my will, but yours. So, yes, we should seek to obey even if we don't want to. And I suspect that all the examples that you gave are probably, you know, probably fit into that category, but I like to go right to Jesus because it just nails the whole question, okay? We should obey, even if we don't want to, but it's not a sin to not want to. That's, that's some comfort, I guess, you know, because frankly, I think we all have desires that we know are not God's desire for us. And it's nice to know that simply having the desire is not a sin. Okay? Now be cautious with the desire because it's easy to act on desire and end up doing something and doing is a sin. Does that make sense? You with me on that? Okay. But now I want you to think about this for a moment here. Well, okay, no, let's go on. Let's, let's go, go ahead with, um, with Christ's situation here. Okay. <coughs> Jesus here, he said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. I think what that means is if completely left to himself, Jesus would have said, I, I don't want to do this. I don't think this is worth it. I don't see that I should. I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. 
My desire says no. I'm not even sure it's, it's common sense. But conscience. Conscience is the voice of God to the soul. And the voice of his father was saying, this is the plan. This is the plan. Right? <clears throat> Well, Jesus did not wait until dying on the cross looked like a fun thing before he moved forward. Are you with me on that? There is a time and a place to grit your teeth and be brave and noble and courageous and do what you know to be right, even though you don't want to. There's a time and a place for that, right? He fought a terrible battle against his own will. This was the great battle. This is, this is what Ellen White says. You know, it's, it's the, the greatest battle ever thought. fought is, is yielding up the will to, to God. He submitted his will to his father. He didn't want to die. He didn't want to die. And I think that's really instructive there. All that he knew at that point, it didn't seem worth it. But it was, well, we'll read another statement here, okay? Uh, in the way things played out, it didn't stay that way, right? Christ submitted his will to his Father, and in the Book of Desire of Age, it says that an angel from heaven pointed him, pointed Jesus to the open heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as a result of his sufferings. He assured Jesus that his death would result in the utter discomfiture of Satan. Discomfiture. <laughs> I like that word. <laughs> I mean, Satan's going to be really uncomfortable if you do this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> his death would result in the utter discomfiture of Satan that the kingdom of this world would be given to the saints of the Most High. He told him that he would see the travail of his soul and be satisfied, for he would see a multitude of the human race saved, eternally saved. Now notice what the angel did for Jesus. He did not come and say, Your father says... He didn't come and say, it's a really smart thing to get crucified. He came and he said, it's worth it. You'll be happy you did. Sometimes we have to press on when the going is tough. And how does God address that? He addresses it by changing our desire. The one that seems to be the weakest is in some ways the strongest. <clears throat> An illustration. You might look at this and think, oh, Green peas, fresh from the garden. How wonderful. I, on the other hand, look at this and think, is this a nightmare? Please wake me up. It just turns out that I don't like green peas. I never have. Okay? Back home, in my parents' home, there is a, a photo someplace up in the archive. I haven't seen it for a long time, but it's there, I'm sure. It looks kind of like this one. This is something I picked up off the internet. That's not the real photo, but it looks kind of like this. And it's a photo of me in the starring role on the right, and my mother in the supporting role on the left, as she put the first spoonful of Gerber green mashed peas in my mouth. Now, the major difference between this photo and the one back in the archives is this photo doesn't have anything like that on it. And the picture back home, it's maybe not quite so large. 
But whatever the size of that first spoonful, it ended up on my mom, not in my stomach. I didn't like green peas from the very beginning, and I can't say I really like them today. Now, you probably didn't care whether I like green peas or not, you know, but this is an illustration. On the other hand, um, well, no, I should, I should defend myself a little bit. I've learned to eat green peas. I don't always spit them out anymore. Uh, you know, sometimes you go to someone's house for dinner and they serve green peas. And so it's just a matter of being polite, you know. And even occasionally my wife will prepare them and I, you know, try to console myself with the idea that there must be vitamins and minerals in there that I could probably just as well get from a banana. But anyhow, it's okay. I, I eat the green peas, okay. I've learned to do that. Sometimes you have to grit your teeth and just do what you have to do, right? Okay. On the other hand, I've never had a problem with apple pie. It works pretty well for me, actually. I like apple pie. So here's my thought. Wouldn't it be cool if some genius botanist would breed a species of green peas that tasted like apple pie? Would that not be cool? This would be a great thing. You'd make a mint. <laughs> what a great thing that would be, right? OK? The only other way to approximate that would be to somehow, probably miraculously, rewire my taste buds or my nervous system or something so that when I ate green peas, I tasted apple pie. Um, that's pretty much God's plan. He calls it the new covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. So this is Paul writing in Hebrews. And he's quoting from Jeremiah 31. And this new covenant that God says he's going to make with his people in the last days is a, is a big deal, actually. It's, this, this, is, um, well, this isn't the whole of it, but in, in Hebrews 8, where Paul is quoting this here, this is the largest single quotation from the Old Testament that ever shows up in the New Testament. Okay? And for good measure, he repeats most of it in, in chapter 10, a couple chapters later. Right? Okay? So Paul's, you know, Paul's putting a big emphasis on this thing. Okay? Here's chapter 10. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds I will write them. Okay, so here's my question. How does this work in practicality? It sounds like such a neat idea to have green peas tasting like apple pie, but how does it work? How does the law get written in my heart? You know, it makes it sound like obedience would be just natural. Having a heart that wants to obey, that enjoys obeying, really seems like it has to be a good thing. It's the best of both worlds, so to speak. You know? I'm doing what's right and reaping all the promises from that, right? And I'm enjoying it. Ah. Oh. Okay, here's a little description of the process, how this works. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Jesus. And if we consent... He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims, so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will. That's what we're talking about. Notice the word up there, consent, and blending into his will. We're, we're right on topic here. This is talking about the will of man, right? Blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will, that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. We're doing what we want to do. The will 
refined and sanctified, will find its highest delight in doing his service. Wow. And in doing his service, you know, you got conscience going with you too. So at least you've always got a, a two-thirds majority. <laughs> you know? uh, there may be some worldly common sense that says, I'm not sure that's a good idea. But you've always got conscience and desire. Always united. The point here is that while it's right and proper to fight temptation and the devil and obey God, even when we don't feel like it, remember, Jesus in Gethsemane, God doesn't ask us to do that forever. Why not? Because it doesn't work. <laughs> it just doesn't work. Desire will win in the end. Instead, God wants to change our desires so that we actually end up enjoying all the stuff that's good for us. Right? The best of both worlds. How could you get better? I'm having fun, and it's good for me. Right? You know, I mean, you've all heard the statements probably. Know, maybe they don't say silly things like this over here, but you know, it's like uh, you know, anything that tastes good, you know, this. If you're going to go on a diet, you know, if it tastes good, spit it out, right? That's the, that's the theory, you know. So, so just suffer. Ah. <laughs> it's supposed to be good for you, so suffer. Ah. How about it's supposed to be good for you, so enjoy yourself? I mean, with that, seems good to me. How does it work? What does it mean, up there in the second line, what does it mean to consent? What is the, what is the experience brought to light there? If we consent, that's the key. If we consent, all this cool stuff happens. How do we do that? Okay. I think consent, as used there, is synonymous with many other terms that we kick around in, in our Christian vocabulary. I think it's the same as surrender, right? Same as conversion type of thing, falling on the rock and being broken, you know, all these expressions that we use, okay? Whatever term you want to use, it involves the will. You know what that means? That means I'm in charge of whether it happens or not. You're in charge of whether it happens or not in your life. Because this is the one thing that you've been given, that you can do with your will. You can't just take it back and say, I'm going to run my life the way I want to run it. That's not an option for you now. Sorry, that we lost that with the fall. You can take it back and give it to Jesus. That's the one thing he's bought for us. <clears throat> it's a choice. And here's a key thought that I want to just kick out. It's a choice that happens before the fact, before the temptation. Okay? So there's a lot of difference between having made a, a predetermined, I know what I will do in this case type of decision, and coming up to the decision and the temptation saying, oh, what should I do? Do you follow me? Okay. So it's like if, as a young person, I've said, you know what? I, I'm just not going to drink alcohol. Period. End of discussion. I'm, I'm not going to touch the stuff. Never. Ain't going to happen. When someone says, hey, Dave, you want a beer? I say, no. I already made that decision. If I haven't made the decision, somebody says, hey, Dave, you want a beer? I'm on the spot. Now I have to think, well, I don't know. Is this, is this a good thing? Do I want a beer? Is this common sense? What's conscience say? And I'm trying to process it when I'm too late in the game. Okay? When you make the decision beforehand, there's a solidity in the mind. When that's combined with a surrender to God, making the decision beforehand by yourself, by the way, is ropes of sand. Right? You, you remember that statement from Steps of Christ, you know, our promises are like ropes of sand. So I may say, I will never touch alcohol. And if I do that just by myself without combining it with and I depend on the surrender of my will to Christ to help me do that. <laughs> okay? That you follow the difference, okay? <clears throat> when that decision is combined with the surrender to God, that's when the Holy Spirit begins to change our desires. It's a process. It takes some time. It's not going to happen immediately. 
but it begins. That's when doing the right thing starts a little bit to be fun. It takes time. There may be some battles along the way, but make those unreserved decisions to obey before the temptation comes. Surrender. And that's a daily thing, right? Then you don't have to debate it all every, every time a temptation comes up. Commit to obedience. Ask the Lord to make it enjoyable. Seriously. The last thing I could ever find it in my heart to do is spend 70 or 80 or 90 years being miserable doing something that I didn't want to do. <coughs> Gritting my whole teeth because this is what I have to do to go to heaven. <coughs> I don't think it's going to work. I just don't think it's going to work. Okay, so why do we go all into all this? Because medical missionary work is self-sacrifice from beginning to end. And you don't naturally desire that. <laughs> and I don't either. <clears throat> Notice this. Then the multitude rose up together against Paul and Silas here, right? And the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. But at midnight... Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. Why were these guys singing? I mean, hello? That's kind of weird. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're in prison. It's a little depressing. They've just been beaten, and Roman beatings were nothing to sneeze at. I mean, they were, they were serious affairs, right? Why were they singing? There may be other ways of looking at it. Maybe they thought a little differently, but here's my, here's my best guess. Because sacrifice is the currency of influence. And they knew what had just happened. They knew what a powerful thing had just been done in their lives. Okay? No one, unless you've got some sort of a serious mental issue, no one wants to suffer for the sake of suffering. No one wants to sacrifice for the sake of sacrificing. That's kind of sick, perhaps. But Paul and Silas had learned to love something that wasn't naturally lovable. They knew that their sacrifice and their suffering was buying for them influence. Okay? Remember the first time Paul was stoned to death? <laughs> okay? It turned out he wasn't dead, right? But they stoned him and they left him for dead. Do you, do you remember what happened out of that? There was a kid standing there watching that. His name was Timothy. That's what inspired Timothy. He says, why did that guy just do that? He just got stoned. And he gets up. He's still happy. That's strange. <laughs> and he heads off to the next town to do it all again. <laughs> They're probably going to stone him in the next town too. Why is he doing that? That's a powerful influence. To Paul, that's what made it all worthwhile. So I'm just going to let my imagination go for a moment here. Why were they singing? I can imagine Paul saying, hey, Silas, do you have any idea how great this is? How many souls are you thinking going to be saved because we got beat up today? I bet they're going to be talking about this 2,000 years from now. Isn't that cool? Come on, man. Let's, let's ice this cake. Got a song? Uh, let's not sing, Jesus, I my cross have taken. Let's sing... Rejoice, ye pure in heart. Come on, Silas. Set a pitch. Let's go. That's what makes it fun. And God will change our hearts. That's the kind of religion I want. I'm not saying I want to get beat up. I still don't. You know, I don't. Okay. 
I'm saying that when Jesus sees something valuable to be gained by some sacrifice or suffering on my part, I want to see that too. I want to be standing in line. I want to have at least enough faith to trust that it really is best and move on joyfully. That was a big part of the apostles' thinking. Look at these verses. So they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. And Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God. It's a part of service for Christ. You're not going to get away from it. But you can do it joyfully. So let's go back to the beginning. Do not for a moment suppose that religion will make you sad and gloomy and will block up the way to success. No, no. Those who in everything... Make God first and last and best, which means that they have given their will to Christ, are the happiest people in the world. And someday, I hope that this will be true of me. Entire surrender to the Lord is something that is revealed in the daily life and it exerts an influence upon other lives. That's where surrender of the will comes to its fullest value. It was Christ's surrender of the will that has exerted an influence on us down through the ages. It's a great quotation. Ellen White says that, that Christ's influence is the weapon wielded by the Father himself as a shoreless, uh, unbounded influence. It, she, she calls it the, um, the highest... Uh, the strongest, the strongest, the, uh, the strongest um, influence emanating from the center of all power is the, is the example of Christ in submission of his will to the Father. That, I think, is what will make us happy. And, you know, sometimes we have to just take a little stock of our life and say, which way am I heading? What am I choosing? You have the choice. God bought that right for you. Not the right that we had before the fall, but the right to surrender your will. I encourage you to surrender your will. When you find yourself battling, Father, I don't want to do this. It doesn't look like it's best. It doesn't look like it's fun. There's a time and a place to grit your teeth. And God will send an angel and help you desire it. And then you get the best of both worlds. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, I just ask that you would work this miracle in my life and in every life of those who are seeking you. We can't understand it. We don't understand the biochemistry. We don't understand the molecular level. We can't even really grasp it. We can't illustrate it. We can't define it. But Lord, we know that it's true. So we pray that you will work this miracle that we might have the privilege of serving you and being happy while we do it. In Jesus' name, amen.